Hello and welcome to this video lecture for the University of Connecticut's online course, Classics and Ancient Mediterranean Studies 1103, Classical Mythology. I'm Roger Travis, Associate Professor of Classics at the University of Connecticut, and whether you're enrolled in this course or not, I hope you enjoy the lecture and learn something about new ways of looking at classics and at myth. Thanks for watching. So Dr. King uses a whole bunch of different techniques here, and I just want to point out three of them to let you know what I'm talking about. The first one I want to point out is metaphor. Now, in the section we watched, there are several metaphors, and Dr. King was a master of metaphor beyond any other speaker I think I know. Um, but let's just take one example. The table of brotherhood. Now, there's no literal table of brotherhood. What he's really saying is that brotherhood is kind of like a table, or that bringing people together in a peaceful way is like sitting them down at a table. Metaphors are, of course, also images, and so what's happening is that an image is being formed in our mind, and we can connect that image with the concept that Dr. King is trying to get across, and it makes that concept persuasive. Now, when you really think about it, this technique and the other two I'm going to talk about are, in a certain sense, tricks. It doesn't make the idea any stronger or weaker on its own actual merits. It just brings that idea home to our human brains in the way that our human brains function in such a way as to make that idea more persuasive for us. I think that that is something that speakers should use, but you can see why rhetoric can develop a bad name. The other two techniques are even more technical than that. The first of them is called anaphora. And that simply means the repetition of a phrase or a word at the beginning of successive sentences. And the most famous one of these from I Have a Dream is the phrase I Have a Dream itself. When you repeat a phrase like that, it makes what you're saying more persuasive. It just does. And again, that clearly has to do with our brain's hardwiring. And the next one is my favorite of the whole speech. And it turns a line that might not have even been uh, a memorable line into something that echoes in my memory and I hope in yours for years to come. I have a dream that one day my children will live in a world where they are judged not by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. And on the day, as you can see in this film, that line earned a huge cheer. Why? Well, alliteration color of their skin, content of their character. By repeating a consonant sound, Dr. King made his words more persuasive than they would have been otherwise. All three of these techniques would have been techniques that Ovid would have practiced along with his fellow upper-class Romans as they got their education in rhetoric. And they would have used all of these techniques along with all of the others that they had learned in the set exercises that they would have been expected to compete in against their fellow students. And one of those exercises was called the Swasoria. In the Swasoria, students took turns persuading, or pretending to persuade, if you will, mythological characters either to do something or not to do something. And so what you can see in all of these stories of women in love with the wrong people is that in their interior monologues, they are trying to persuade themselves one way and then another. And Ovid applies to these interior monologues a lot of the rhetorical skill that he would have learned in the schools. And in Book 9, this is page 214 of the Melville translation, there's a great example. What we're going to see Ovid doing as he writes this monologue for Biblis is employing a rhetorical technique called exemplum. And that's where an example either from myth or from history is brought in in support of a position. Biblis is here trying to persuade herself that she should go after her brother. What do my dreams portend? What weight have dreams? Do dreams have weight at all? The gods forbid, yet gods have loved their sisters. Yes, indeed. Why Saturn married Opes, his kin by blood, and Ocean Tethys and Olympus's lord Jove married Juno. 
But the gods above are laws unto themselves. Why try to fit the different rules of heaven to modes of men? This flame I'll force forbidden from my breast, or if I fail, oh, let me perish first. And as I'm laid dead on my bier, then let my brother kiss me. Yet for what I want, two minds must meet. Suppose it brings delight to me, it must be sinful in his sight. But then no scruples held the fabled sons of Aeolus from their six sisters' beds. How do I know these stories? Why so pat these precedents? What will become of me? When Ovid has Biblis say, why so pat these precedents at the end of that passage, he's making reference to the pat nature of the exemplar that would have been used in the Swasorii. And so he is letting his audience know that, in fact, he's doing this like a Swasoria. The big difference is that, like the other women doing their interior monologues, Biblis goes back and forth on the question. And so she's actually doing both sides of the Swasoria. That is, There would have been one student persuading a mythological character one way, another student persuading a mythological character another way, and here Ovid is combining them both into one speech, I think more or less just for fun. And just as he was using tragedy to take apart the integrity of what it means to be a decision-making human, here he's using rhetoric to make it clear to the Romans who were reading who would have been products of this system of rhetorical education, that their rhetorical education is too pat, that it doesn't answer the need when you come up against something like this perversion, and in turn, when you come up against something that creates this as perversion, that is, Augustus's family legislation. So there you have tragedy and rhetoric. Now we move on to prurience.